Hello and welcome to this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Clarkson. Our guest today is Doug Stoffer, and we are glad to have you, Doug. Oh, it's good to be here. I always enjoy uh, being on the set of Prophecy in the News, and uh, boy, the second time with you, it's exciting. I tell you, it's just uh, really a blessing to be here. Well, we're looking forward to talking about the uh, pre-trib rapture, and we throw those words around, but they're biblical concepts, and I'm excited about that. You spoke at our Prophecy in the News uh, conferences last year, did you not? Yes, I did. Looking forward to March. I think you have one down in Orlando again. Spring 2015, and we want to invite you to take advantage of that. We have a marvelous Bible prophecy conference lined up. And you can go online and register or look at our magazine and find that information. Hello, I'm Dr. Kevin Clarkson. Excited to invite you to the second annual Orlando Prophecy Summit. It's taking place this March 5, 6, and 7. 2015 and I'd love for you to be our guest. It's going to be in sunny Orlando, Florida as I mentioned. We have an incredible lineup of speakers for you this year. The New York Times best-selling author Jonathan Kahn will be there and his brand new book is breaking the record set by his first book The Harbinger and Bill Solace has made the forgotten prophecies of the Bible come back to life. Psalm 83 and Jeremiah 49 are prophecies that were written for our times. Paul McGuire wowed the crowds in Colorado Springs with his presentation. Paul will definitely be having something new and exciting up his sleeve for us in Orlando. These are just a few of the prophecy experts that are going to be with us. You can register and the cost is only $90 and these three days of exciting teaching are going to be available to you by calling 1-800-475-1111. Well I want to just kind of couch this with a scripture and you will already know where I'm going because I read uh, some of your own uh, questions to tantalize us. But I want to go to Revelation chapter 4, and, uh, and I want to approach this with you. If I can set the table for a minute, okay? Sure. And I kind of know how I deal with people, but I love to hear how other people deal with folks. Some of our listeners today, you may have friends that, you know, they're kind of skeptical about prophecy, or they say, well, it's just all going to work out, and, you know, all this stuff, you're trying to find a rapture. That word's not even in the Bible. Had a guy come up, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. And, and I listened to him a little while when, when he was done. I kind of had to point out, well, do you believe in the Trinity? And he said, yes. And I said, you know, the word Trinity is not even the Bible. And I said, do you believe in the Bible? And he said, yeah. And I said, do you know the word Bible is not in the Bible? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Rapture is just our term. And uh, it, it means the catching up of the saints of God. And I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 4. Uh, just to set in context, the book of Revelation is obviously the most powerful statement about the coming of the Lord. And chapters 2 and 3 describe the seven churches. And they not only depict seven congregations and seven individual types of believers, but they describe seven ages of the, of the church's uh, epoch in time. And then beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, John, who really typifies the saints and people of God, says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, and that reckons back to chapter 1 when Jesus spoke to him, the first voice I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne and then he has the vision of the throne room of God sure. and, and John represents the church because at the end of the church age the church hears the trumpet and is summoned up out of here and that's just one little uh, crisp inkling of it but it's really throughout the word of God and so I would love to talk with you about some of the things that you've noted and sure and well I'll springboard off of that then um, the funny thing is you know they say well that's not that's not the rapture it's a picture of the rapture but what you see in verse 4 right after that mm -hmm. that's Revelation 4 4 round about the throne were four and twenty uh, seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold now that's kings and priests. That That's is right. somebody with a crown, king, somebody with white raiment, a priest. So you have kings and priests. Who are the kings and priests? If you want to just throw out the rapture, then who do you have up there with these 24 representing a larger multitude? And that is, that is what we are. Now, another thing there is it says, uh, come up here that I will show thee things which must be hereafter. What I do is I take people back to chapter 1, verse 19. Bible says, write the things which thou hast seen right. and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, we already know in chapter 4, verse 2, the hereafter is going to follow that. So that's going to be seeing the kings and priests in heaven 
and everything else that goes on, chapter that's 5, right. 6, and the tribulation, and so on. So that's after. But then he says, the things which thou hast seen. So what are the things he's seen? Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest. So that's past tense. That's Indeed. the things he's seen. In my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the things that he's seen are the seven churches which are representative of the last 2,000 years of church history. Exactly. So the things he's seen are the church is church history. Uh, the things that are is the rapture, Revelation 4.1. And the things which shall be hereafter in chapter 4, verse 2, is everything after the rapture of the church. Listen, this Bible's perfect. Uh, it is, it is. We just need to believe it instead of changing it. And I haven't read your uh, one book you alluded to earlier called Rightly Divided, or Rightly Dividing. Uh, one book, Rightly Divided. Rightly Divided, but that's a, uh, that's a reference to uh, the words in Timothy. Right. The Word of God does a rightly divide out. Right. And when you really have eyes to see... And the spirit shows you, you see these things. Absolutely. Well, let me just ask you, Doug, why do you think people are debating the rapture more today than in past decades? Well, uh, there's probably about 10 different answers. I'll just throw one okay. or two out. We'll go with that. But uh, the first one is in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's speaking about today. And what we've got is we just have a lukewarm Christianity today. The world is turning away from God. Churches are turning away That's from it. God. You know, they, they're putting a church on a corner and taking the whole corner and making it a mega church and saying, hey, come on over here. You don't have to change. You can come as you are and, and leave as, as you are. are. That's, that's right. right. And that's not what we need. That's not the word that says repent. Right. And that's not what the church is for. Amen. Well, that's good. That's a really good answer. Uh, you know, we had a political election a few years ago in this country and it showed me how thirsty people are for something different because the theme was hope and change what people don't realize is hope and change was backwards because jesus came preaching and he said repent change for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and that's your hope so the change and then the hope right. there's hope if you change right and you can't change but the lord can lead you to change and help Absolutely. you change yes. so again man has it backwards he does hope and change but jesus says no repent and then change comes. Right. So good word. Well, I find and and I don't know that you have any just firm, hard answers for this. But to this larger question, I find uh, I've been a pastor, you know, 30 years when I was starting in the ministry. There was a lot of interest in prophetic uh, studies. And, you know, we had speakers in the church and conferences and you still can find those. But today you have to go hunting for them. Why the waning interest and maybe you, partly what you said a moment ago, but why even among pastors and even among millennials today, such a diminished interest? I what are your it, thoughts? I think it takes work. I think if you're going to be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, 2 Timothy 2.15, you're going to have to work at the scripture. What the pastors many times don't want is they don't want company, somebody coming in and questioning them. Think about it. I can go through, I can give my homily, which uh -huh. we don't give, but I can give my little sermonette on Sunday morning um, and go home, uh, do my own thing, uh, take it easy, and then come back maybe Sunday night, if I even have Sunday night, Wednesday night, if I even have Wednesday night, and that's it. What I, don't I don't have to have people asking me questions that I can't answer because I haven't been in the book. And I think what the problem is, is people are afraid, uh, pastors... Uh, teachers of the Bible that somebody's going to ask them a question they don't understand or don't know. To me, I treasure those questions because then I have to go figure out what the answer is, find out what the answer is, pray and say, Lord, I don't have the answer. That's right. And as he gives me more answers, I sit back and, and, and my faith, my, my strength, my, my zeal is just ratcheted up Amen. because God's given me an answer that I didn't have before and showed himself true to me again. So it's real exciting. I, I feel bad for the pastors that aren't wanting to do that because it, it is it is just something that's life changing day by day Amen. by day. Amen. You know, you not only get into God's word, God's word gets into you. Right. And what a transformation. Well, you know, the Bible speaks in uh, Peter talked about we have a more sure word of prophecy. Right. Where does that word take us? What does that mean? Well, what's <clears throat> really neat about that is he said that we had seen the vision of, of Jesus Christ's transfiguration. Uh, God spoke from heaven 
And then he says, he says, you know, that that's great. Oh, it was it was a blessing. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. Well, first of all, he calls this a more sure word than hearing the voice from right. heaven, because now it's written. I mean, you can hear a voice from heaven or think it's from heaven if you have your stomach growling from what you've eaten. <laughs> and you say, well, that's, you know, that's God speaking to me and I need to come up with a new religion like the Mormons did or Jehovah's Witnesses or those groups. No, we're not going to have any further revelation. All the revelation that we have is in the page of this book. Now, we may have the illumination of the revelation, which is the light shining on the revelation that's already in the book. Exactly. But we're not going to have any more revelation. The revelation, the prophecy ceased. But the fact that it says it's a more sure word of prophecy is exciting to me because I'm looking at the pages of this book in my hand that I can hold, I can read, I can study, I can learn, and I have a more sure word of prophecy than hearing a voice from heaven. Yeah, and Peter was there on the mountain with Jesus. But, you know, even in time, the, the, uh, the voice uh, echo faded, sound waves faded away, the vision vanished. And even years later, as an old man, he can recall it by memory, but he's not standing in it. But the word... The word is given and it is spoken eternally with us always, always. Well, let me just ask you this. Um, you take the Bible and I think you uh, have done some of this maybe in our conferences, but you say that there are uh, major themes of Bible prophecy and you have five that you like to uh, delineate. I do. Uh, the five R's is what I call them. It's not reading, writing, and arithmetic because I guess we'd have to misspell arithmetic to do that. Uh, but when you go through there, and I think it's on the back. Uh, it is. I listed them here. Uh, let's see. The rebirth of Israel, the five major themes. The rebirth of Israel, the realignment of the nations, the rapture of the church, the return of Christ, the revelation of the millennium and eternity future. So the five R's of mm -hmm. uh, the five major themes of uh, prophecy is right there, I believe. And when you say realignment of the nations, you're specifically going where with that? Well, the realignment of the nations is the fact that um, there will be, you know, Gog and Magog, there'll be the ten horns, that type of thing. So it's going to be a realignment. Um, I don't think we're going to have the, uh, you know, the common market and the, um, uh, what would we have, the, the Russians against us, the uh -huh. East and Cold West. War, yes, East the, West. Yeah, we won't have that. It'll be the, the realignment. Right, right, right. And I think Matthew talks about those nations that... Uh, support Israel versus those that don't. And that's going to be the dividing line. That's going to be the realignment. That's good. That's good. I might mention, since we alluded to this resource, uh, we have Doug's teaching here on three DVDs. It's called God's Wrath versus the Pre-Tribulation Rapture. And this is a wonderful resource. It's over six hours of teaching. And I think there are about six or seven full sessions on here. And this is available to you if you want to get it. Uh, you can go to our online store or call the 800 number on your screen. It's selling for $34.95 plus shipping and handling. But we'll mention that. Well, let's jump back into this. I, I'm intrigued by this uh, thought. Some people claim the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture is, you know, relatively new teaching. We've heard that this came from uh, uh, Nelson Darby, John Darby and, and some of the uh, Mennonite brethren, the brethren movement that arose in England uh, in the last century and that this is all kind of imposed on scripture and it was never there to which i say there's a good greek word for that baloney <laughs> with cheese with cheese and uh what i do is i take people to the bible and i say okay well here's here's what the bible says uh ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in god who created all things by jesus christ to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So it's made known by the church. Some of these people want to go into the uh, church fathers and say, well, the church fathers didn't teach such and such. The church fathers also taught replacement theology. So, I mean, you're sitting here and you're saying to me, look, it's what the church fathers, and if they didn't teach a specific thing, Wait a minute, what about the error or the heresy that many of them taught? Yeah. Are you going to say that that's good because they taught it? So what they say is it's a new teaching. What I say to that is, well, Daniel's a closed book. When's it going to be open? The time of the end. That's right. So is Daniel being open today because of the period of time in which we live? And the answer to that is probably yes. So that's what the progressive illumination is. In other words, we have all the revelation here. But we don't have the illumination of the revelation until God gives it to us. So you have people that are saying, well, um, 
you know, if they didn't teach it 150 years ago, I don't believe it. And I say, well, who taught about uh, RFID chips 150 years ago? That's right. So it can't be true because the church fathers didn't mention RFID chip. No. Why does the Bible say in Revelation 6 that the mark will be in the right hand and in the forehead? It'll be in there because that's what not a chip on, does. Not on. But in. Now, it does say on the forehead, which you know. Mm -hmm. It says in the right hand, in the forehead, and on the forehead. Because I believe it'll be something that's going to go in there. You can see it there also. Mm -hmm. It'll be visible. Whereas the one in the right hand will just be in, not necessarily on. But that's an RFID chip. To say you can't teach that because it's a new teaching, is that somehow bad? No. What about a hemp device? The Bible talks that they're going to they're going to have swords and spears and mm -hmm. they're going to chop off the heads. Why? Well, probably because there's going to be an, uh, a hemp device. That's a high altitude electromagnetic pulse. What's that do? It fries all electrical circuitry. The reason that the mark won't be uh, destroyed at that time is because it's biometric. Right. It uh, it's going to come off the heat of the body and that's what's going to make it work. It's not going to fry that, but it will fry everything else. What's that going to mean? Well, they're going to go back to swords. Spears, exactly. And maybe even guillotines because they're not going to have that. I mean, think about it. You got Israel that flees in the wilderness. One nuke. I mean, they can see them from satellite. Where are they? Right there. Well, wait, there's no satellites, no nukes, no nothing. That's what I think the Bible. So we've always looked at it. Now, 150 years ago, they just said, oh, well, that's just uh, that really means guns or 100 years ago. That means guns. It's just figurative. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe that's what we're going back to. <laughs> but that's what progressive illumination would I be, that we can illuminate, you. we can see things in the Bible. They become sharper now. in focus the closer we get. Oh, absolutely. things that are changing and happening. And, you know, that's an incredible, to me, evidence of the power of the Word of God. And, and we see that in so many areas. Do you want to give some other examples of uh, progressive illumination? Well, you mentioned Well, two, I mentioned the hemp device. I mentioned, you can mention drones. You can mention social security cards. I mean, think about it. We, we've got people that... Think about the tattoo phenomenon. Who would ever think that you can go into every city on every other street and see a tattoo parlor? Yeah. Why? It's getting people ready to mark their body, mark their <coughs> body. Football players marking their body. Uh, Hollywood marking their body. People are getting ready to take a mark. And it's just being set up and they're like sheep to the slaughter. And people have no idea where they're going with it. And I want to backtrack some with this, if I can, for just a moment, if, if uh, you know, you'll indulge me to speak about that to you, is that think back to the reformers. You know, they had a replacement theology. For those of you that don't know what replacement theology means, that's every time you find a promise to Israel, you scoop it aside and say, oh, well, that means the church. Well, when the reformers came of age and rediscovered, thank God, justification by faith and salvation, that's great. But there was no nation of Israel the Jews were dispersed the land had been the uh, battle site of the Crusades it was inhabited by Arabs and Christians and just a few sparse Jews at various times so if I'm living in the 1500s 1600s studying my Bible and it's talking about the gathering of Israel I don't have the faith to see that unless I'm a very very strong man of faith I, I try to make it fit what I see rather than believe the naked word of God and that's why John Calvin wrote a whole exposition of the Bible and stopped after the book of Jude. He didn't go into Revelation. He didn't understand it. And Martin Luther uh, of the same age even turned uh, really against the Jews and was anti-Semitic. And that was whipped up later by the Nazis as their great German theologian was, was their uh, evidence for that. But Luther didn't understand. When they look back again to these literal nations, there was not a Jewish state. It was with some people who had, I think, some visionary faith that took the word at its just plain statement and, and began to see it. And then their faith became sight because we saw the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948. Right. And a lot of that went on before 1948, oh, just like oh, you're pointing coming out. out. That's right. Yes. I mean, that that's was kind faith. of the culmination. Yes. That that's true faith to think about the nation of Israel being a nation in the land when that was an impossibility and think about how that came about with the nazis so the nazis you know put them in concentration camps they don't have a home they've been uh killed and destroyed and now all of a sudden they need a place to go and they send them back to israel now you know would 
would I like to have seen a different way for that to come to pass? Absolutely. But God is sovereign in his ways. He yes, just, he is. And that's not Calvinistic at all. It's just God is sovereign. That's right. And what I try to do is I just try to believe God and just trust God. Amen. And when he shows me something, I want to believe the book rather than being intimidated by the brethren that say, well, wait a minute, you can't teach a pre-tribulation rapture because. No, I'm going to teach it because the Bible teaches it. That's it. That's it. Well, uh, just to follow along these same thoughts uh, with you, Doug, some people uh, believe Christians will go through the tribulation because the Bible does say that we must suffer, uh, you know, tribulation and enter the kingdom of God. And Paul says we go through tribulations and they can be turned into glory and, uh, and all in Romans 5. But how does that stack up against the belief that we're raptured out of tribulation? Well, and here's the thing, and here, here's what I've been told, that people in the... Uh, in World War II in Germany, or in, in England, London, uh, those bombs were falling. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're not supposed to be going through the tribulation. So, or even through tribulation. So, they left the church and never came back because of the false teaching of a pre-tribulation rapture. And I just look at that and say, you, you've got to be kidding me. I've always taught all those that live godly in Christ That's Jesus it. shall suffer persecution. Uh, Paul talks about tribulation over and over again. The great tribulation and the tribulation as a period of time are only mentioned two times each. And that's a period of time, not a state of being. There you go. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to suffer. Paul talked about going through tribulations. Paul was stoned. Paul, uh, Paul wasn't sitting here saying, well, we're not going to have any tribulation as a Christian. I think the misnomer there is we sometimes fall into a trap. and We say, well, God won't leave us here because he isn't going to let uh, hit the church go through the tribulation because he wouldn't want to do that to us and yet he that means he's not going to let us suffer tribulation at all and I think we we backed ourselves in the corner we're not going to be here not because God isn't going to let us do it so much it's because it's back to the nation of Israel 144,000 right. the two witnesses Israel Israel the land Jerusalem um, it's all Israel it's not it's not the church um, a, a, another point I, I would look at along those lines is that Daniel's 70th week is the time of Jacob's trouble. It is not yes. the church. We're going to suffer tribulation. Uh, I go through in the in the video series and I show here's where it says we're going to suffer tribulation, suffer, suffer, suffer. But it's not the period of time known as the tribulation. That's just general tribulation that all believers and all people experience. Right. And then, as you said, the great tribulation. And the Greeks, very specific, Jesus said, the tribulation, the great one. Right. And it's a definite era of time. And uh, God's not putting his bride through that. And we've got so many instances of that. I know what the other one was. We are ambassadors. So unlike some countries, they don't home. call your ambassadors home. He's going to call his ambassadors Amen. home. And that's what we need to think about is and that's how when war is declared. Yes. We call our ambassadors home and then we declare war. Right. And if he's going to declare war on this earth. He's going to call his ambassadors home. Amen. Not so much that we're not going to suffer tribulation because we are. I'm sure we are. But not as ambassadors for him whenever he declares war. Good way to put that. Yeah. Well, that's good. Thank you for bringing it up. Well, let me just ask you along this line. What are the four different teachings about the rapture? Well, you've got the from the rapture. Well, and, and you have major teachings. There's other ones, too, like a, you know, a partial. But you've got pre-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation rapture, mid-trib rapture, and a pre-wrath rapture. <clears throat> and what I do is I show these and then I go into the post-tribulation one and I say, yeah, I have, I have it on the screen. You, you go up and you come right back down. It, right. it doesn't make any sense. The problem with a post-tribulation rapture is that all the believers would be caught up in the air and um, there wouldn't be anybody here to populate the millennium. So if it's a post-tribulation, all believers are caught up. He destroys everybody else at the second coming and there's nobody left to go in the millennium with natural bodies. Yeah, no non-glorified humans. And so it can't be. <laughs> right, it eliminate absolutely that absolutely cannot be. And then the uh, pre-wrath and the uh, mid-trib, it's just, it's just not a good there's, eschological teaching. There's not really a solid case for it at all. No, no. So what I say is let's just teach what the Bible teaches. Amen. It teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's stick with the fundamentals of teaching. You say, well, it was, it was John Nelson Darby or some woman that had a vision. I don't care what you say it is. Uh, when you go back and you quote the church fathers to me, I can go quote the church fathers and show their heresy. Mm -hmm. 
So what do you do? You, are you going to take the heresy with the fact that they didn't teach something that maybe Daniel was still a closed book back then? Daniel's becoming an open book until the time of the end. And to say that Daniel's never going to be open is ludicrous. Why would God write Daniel and keep that stuff under wraps when he said it's going to be revealed in the last he days? Did. He promised that, yes. Well, you've piqued my curiosity with a question I want to ask. Um, how's the story of Lazarus, a prophetic witness? Well, I like that. I mean, when you when you look <laughs> at Lazarus and um, John chapter 11, yeah. and and I've just got to be honest with you, uh, I spent 40 minutes in one of those uh, lectures uh, teaching on Lazarus and John chapter 11, um, Lazarus, Mary and Martha and how they picture things. But uh, when you go through, I mean, like I'm just jumping here, verse 19, many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort her twice in John chapter 11. You have the word comfort, just like you do in First Thessalonians chapter four and First Thessalonians chapter five. Uh, I remember, well, verse six. And when he had heard, therefore, he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. Why two days? Well, a day is a thousand years. Thousand years is one day. Two days represents two thousand years, just like Hosea chapter six, verse right. two. Um, Lazarus sleepeth. Um, and, and again, there are so many uh, points. I, I'm thinking of the one where um, she says, uh, I think Martha or Mary says, oh, here it is, verse 21. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Well, if Jesus comes back, we're not going to die. Right. This picture is so impacting. Uh, Jesus says, I am the resurrection, the life, verse 25. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So the dead will be resurrected. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Well, that's the translation of the saints or picture that's of the rapture right. of the church. That's right. Believest thou this? Well, for that guy that doesn't believe it, I feel bad for him because the Bible has a picture right here of Lazarus and the pre-tribulation rapture. And that's what two minutes of a 40 minute lecture. I, I think that's a really powerful, powerful picture. It is. And uh, our time is escaping and we're probably going to need to draw to a close. But may I just say to you, it's uh, been a delight to discuss these things and you know, where you ended, Jesus said, uh, Martha gives this fuzzy answer, I believe he'll rise at the last day. And Jesus says, time out, wait a minute. The resurrection is not a doctrine, it's me. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's his word to all of us. If you've never believed in Jesus Christ, he promises you, if you will put your faith in him and ask him to be your savior and Lord, he will forgive your sin and you will never die. That's the promise of scripture. He's a risen Lord, he's defeated death. And because he lives, we also can live. So let's look to Jesus and keep looking up. Thank you, Doug. Thank you.